we're doing uh, the current affairs for the 21st of March 2022 now some of the topics that we'll be doing today would be uh, regarding an African technique which is used to uh, group the deer together okay uh, the next topic that we'll be discussing is the rehabilitation of African cheetahs uh, in India in Nora Dehi what are the advantages of it what are the disadvantages of it and uh, we spoke some days back about India's Arctic policy so we'll discuss about what are the steps that are being taken by India towards this Arctic policy also we'll discuss about the Houthi strikes on Saudi Arabia okay the rest of these three topics are very static topics apart from Assam Accord which we shall discuss a little in detail moving on the first topic this is known as the Boma technique uh, as you can see uh, over here we have a funnel shaped uh, enclosure which is used to trap the animals without scaring them or affecting them this is known as the Boma technique and this is an ancient African technique in order to uh, safeguard animals okay the reason why this Boma technique is is in use is because it has been used at the Keladiyo National Park in Rajasthan for capturing and translocating spotted deer now this uh, this spotted deer why is it being translocated it is being translocated to the Mukundra Hills Tiger Reserve for the tiger population over there the move will lead to herbivores populating the forest ahead of proposed shifting of two tigers to Mukundara. Now what is the Boma technique? This Boma technique is very popular in Africa and it lures animals into an enclosure by chasing them through a funnel like fencing. The funnel tapers into an animal selection come loading chute supported with grass mats and green net to make it opaque for animals which are then herded into a large vehicle. Okay the vehicle is kept over here. And this is the funnel through which the animals are guided okay and over here uh, they are transported to these trucks this old technique was earlier utilized to capture wild elephants the National Tiger Conservation Authority's technical committee has approved a proposal to shift two tigers from Ranthambore National Park to Mukundra Tiger Reserve and before these tigers get there uh, you know the government officials are trying to populate the Mukundra Tiger Reserve so that these tigers have enough prey base now what is the Mukundara tiger reserve this reserve is spread across 759 square kilometers and it is created with portions of Darra, Chambal and Jawhar Sagar wildlife sanctuaries in southeastern Rajasthan okay recently six cheetals or spotted deer were shifted by using the Boma technique the herbivores are confined without any physical contact in the enclosure spread over 10 hectares for a few days with the management of grass feed and water and their movement was monitored from watchtowers. Cheetals or spotted deers, these are very faint hearted and a modified large truck okay, which had water bodies, fountain and grass carpet that was used for the translocation. Okay. Now uh, capturing and move, moving ungulates, ungulates are animals like deer, giraffes etc. Okay. Zebras. will make a significant contribution to the prey base management in the state and this is how prey is being translocated to Mukundara Tiger Reserve a similar translocation was carried out for Kaila Devi Wildlife Sanctuary please know that this also in Rajasthan the translocation of herbivores would reduce the preying upon of rural cattle sheep and goat around the tiger reserves it is believed why because when the tigers tigers are the apex predators and if they have enough uh, prey to feed upon they will not result in attacking the rural cattle and sheep and this will also automatically reduce human animal conflict now uh, how do you transfer tigers from one reserve to another first of all you need to get the permission of the national tiger conservation authority okay please know that the national tiger conservation authority was developed uh, it was established under the wildlife protection act of 1972 and hence it is a statutory body also please know 
that the chairperson of the National Tiger Conservation Authority is the Minister of Environment. Of Environment. He is the chairperson. Now, the National Tiger Conservation Authority is a statutory body under the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change. It was constituted under the Wildlife Protection Act uh, in 2006 for strengthening of tiger conservation. Okay. Now, no alteration, mind you, no alteration in the boundaries of a tiger reserve can be made without the recommendation of the NTCA and approval for the National Board of wildlife now what is the national board of wildlife this is the apex entity when it comes to safeguarding of any uh, safeguarding of any animals in the country this is actually chaired by the prime minister and any decisions with regard to any wildlife sanctuary or national park have to be taken only by the national board of wildlife now also this uh, National Board of Wildlife, it, its vice chairperson is the Minister of Environment. Okay. Now, no state government shall denotify a tiger reserve except in public interest with the approval of the NTCA and the approval of the National Board of Wildlife. So, the NTCA, NTCA is the prime entity with regards to tigers while it has to act in concert with the National Board of Wildlife. Also, the National Board of Wildlife is extremely important when it comes to taking any decisions related to any wildlife sanctuaries or national parks. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of Project Tiger and Tiger Census and all. These are the topics which are related to tigers. A Tiger Census happens in India every four years and it is conducted by the National Tiger Conservation Authority. Okay. Now, the fourth tiger uh, census was conducted in 2019 and the next one will be in 2023. Okay. Uh, now, related to this, M stripes, there is an app called M stripes. This is used to maintain a track of the number of tigers in every tiger reserve. Also, in order to ensure that the number of tigers in the country are are growing and tigers are conserved project tiger was launched project tiger was launched in 1973 this project tiger it covers around 50 tiger reserves in india we have around 50 tiger reserves i think 51 to be very precise okay it is a centrally sponsored scheme of the ministry of environment okay okay uh, and it ensures since it's a centrally sponsored scheme it ensures implementation in partnership with the states and there is a 50 50 share in terms of uh, funding between the state and the center itself okay uh, when it comes to tiger reserves these are divided into core areas and buffer areas the core areas have the status of a national park while the buffer or the peripheral areas are a mixture of forest and non-forest land okay you have the core area and around that you have the buffer area this is the buffer area okay okay the next topic that we will discuss is the introduction of african cheetahs in india Please see this. African cheetahs are being translocated from Namibia to Nora Dehi. Nora Dehi is in the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. And this entire project is being done with a cost of around 260 crores. Okay. Uh, the cheetah, which became extinct in India after independence, is all set to return to with the union government launching an action plan for their translocation. According to the plan, about 50 of these big cats will be introduced in the next 5 years from African savannas. Okay. Now, what is the distribution of cheetahs in... What was the distribution of cheetahs in India and where can they survive? Okay. Historically, Asiatic cheetahs had a very wide distribution in India. Okay. They stretched 
from as wide as Punjab in the north till Tirunelveli in Tamil Nadu in the south and from Gujarat to West Bengal in the east. The distribution range of cheetahs was wide and spread over the entire subcontinent. The cheetah's habitat is also diverse, favoring more open habitats, scrub forests, dry grasslands, savannas, and other arid and semi-arid open habitats. So cheetahs did not prefer, you know, thickly forested uh, areas or evergreen areas. Rather, they favored open habitats. Now, what is this reintroduction? Reintroduction means releasing of a species in an area where it can survive. Okay, reintroduction is done after a species goes to extinction or it is extinct in the wild and hence there is uh, breeding in private and then the repopulation of that area, I mean repopulation of uh, that species is done in that particular area. Reintroduction of large carnivores have increasingly been recognized as a strategy to conserve threatened species and restore ecosystem functions. Cheetahs can also be used as a flagship and umbrella species to garner resources. It can also draw a lot of attention. So flagship species are those species with which you can draw a lot of attention to everyday issues. Like say for example the Indian elephant. It can be used to draw attention to the plight of elephants, tigers. These are all flagship uh, species. Umbrella species means the species which are at the top of the apex pyramid group. No, the cheetah is the only large carnivore, only, that has been extirpated mainly by overhunting in India in historical times. India now has the economic ability and hence it is re translocating its lost natural heritage. However, this entire move has also been criticized. Okay, why is it criticized? Because there is such a huge spending. We have seen over here that 260 crores is being spent for translocating these cheetahs. But till now, you know, Indian ecosystems did not have cheetahs and they were still doing pretty fine. So now this entire 260 crores seems like a wasteful expenditure. Rather, this 260 crores can be used on safeguarding of those animals which are going into extinction currently. It is believed that African cheetahs are not required to perform the role of top predators in these habitats. When the site that is Kuno Palpur and uh, nearby Nora Dehi that they have identified already has a resident population of leopards, transient tigers and also is also the site for translocation of Asiatic lions. There are already these apex predators. Hence why do you need to repopulate this area with one more apex predator which is the cheetah. Okay. In other open dry habitats there are species performing this role that is the wolf and the caracal they also perform the role that the cheetah performs and both these animals are endangered hence you know this money can be used to protect those animals which are currently going extinct the government's official estimate is expecting at best only a few dozen cheetahs at a couple of sites this is expected in the near future okay and this is a very small number Okay, such a small number of cats at very few sites cannot meet the stated goal of performing the ecological function of safeguarding the ecology. Facts about the cheetah. The cheetah is one of the oldest of the big cat species with ancestors that can be traced to more than 5 million years ago to the Miocene era. The cheetah is also the world's fastest land mammal. The country's last spotted cheetah died in Chhattisgarh in 1947 itself. Later, the cheetah, which is the fastest land animal, was declared extinct in 1952. The Asiatic cheetah is classified as critically endangered under the IUCN, while the African cheetah is classified as vulnerable under the IUCN. Okay, now what are the other differences between the Asiatic cheetah and the African cheetah? The Asiatic cheetah is also smaller. Okay, however, it has a thicker coat. It has a thicker coat as compared to the African cheetah and also it has a more powerful neck it has a powerful neck and it also has a better and more powerful legs and hence it can run faster as compared to the African cheetah okay uh, also if you have seen the pictures of an Asiatic cheetah and an African cheetah an Asiatic cheetah often tends to have orangish eyes 
it has orange or pinkish eyes while the african cheetah has normal eyes okay it has normal whitish uh, eyes hmm. so as opposed to what the normal convention is asiatic cheetah seems to be a lot more healthier also both these animals belong to uh, sites appendix one okay and the other thing is that while the african cheetah has more than 6000 you know num in numbers the asiatic cheetah only has 40 to 50 in numbers and these 40 to 50 are also found only in one country which is iran asiatic cheetahs have a cat like appearance they don't uh, resemble a uh, an apex predator okay now what is the current status of the project according to government this kuno palpur sanctuary it is ready to receive the cheetahs about a month ago we discussed this government officials also visited namibia to inspect the cheetahs however uh, there are also talks that namibia expects india to support uh, namibia in the export of certain animal products and that is the reason why it's getting delayed a little the cheetahs are to be provided by the cheetah conservation fund an ngo and not the namibian government please remember this the cheetahs are actually being provided by an ngo and not by the Namibian government. Three to five cheetahs are expected to be a part of this first group of cats and they will reach by May 2022. Okay. Uh, next, moving on. India hopes to put down roots in the Arctic. India aspires to have a permanent presence with more research and satellite ground stations in the Arctic region suggested its Arctic policy document. India now has a single station which is known as the Himadri in Svalbard uh, where research personnel are usually present for about 180 days. India has had a research base in the region since 2008 which is Himadri and also has two observatories. Okay. Uh, now, what are the steps that are being taken by India currently? We spoke about the Arctic policy of the country. Now, under this policy, we had outlined that India has six goals. What are the steps that are being taken by India in order to achieve this policy? India is in the process of procuring an icebreaker research vessel. Through its existing satellites, India aspires to capture more detailed images to assist in the development of the Arctic region. India has also sent 13 expeditions to the Arctic since 2007 and runs 23 active science projects. Nearly 25 institutes and universities are involved in Arctic research. And also several papers have been published regarding Arctic. What is the importance of the Arctic? We had discussed the importance of the Arctic uh, some time back. However, again, Arctic weather influences the Indian monsoon and hence it is important to understand the Arctic weather in order to understand the Indian monsoon itself. The region is important to study climate change and also the melting of ice caps and what is the rate at which the ice caps are melting and uh, what is the rate at which the sea uh, water is increasing the depth of the sea water is increasing and beyond science okay india also sees several business opportunities such as exploration of natural resources and minerals and uh, identification of investment opportunities in arctic infrastructure such as offshore exploration mining ports railways information technology and airports it is also expected that the indian private industry will invest in the establishment of such infrastructure Okay, what is this Arctic Council? The Arctic Council is a leading intergovernmental forum promoting cooperation, coordination and interaction between the Arctic states, Arctic indigenous communities and other Arctic inhabitants on common Arctic issues. These are usually related to sustainable development. Please remember this Arctic Council, it ensures the interaction between not just countries. It is an intergovernmental agency that provides interaction between countries arctic indigenous communities and arctic inhabitants the arctic council works as a consensus based body which means that only if all the countries accept can decisions move forward to deal with issues such as change in biodiversity melting sea ice plastic pollution black carbon etc around eight countries which have borders with the arctic circle are a part of it most of them are given in this map over here you can see this map Russia is a part of the Arctic Council permanent member. 
uh, United States is a permanent member, Canada is a permanent member, Denmark, Greenland is a permanent member, Iceland is a permanent member, Norway is, an, uh, is a permanent member and Finland and Sweden, eight countries are permanent members of the Arctic Council. While India has the status of an observer member, even China has the status of an observer member. Okay. Recently, most recently, Switzerland became an observer member and they participate in several meetings that are mostly a th you know themed and around research the arctic council secretariat is in norway also please know that the arctic council was set up in 1996 through the ottawa declaration ottawa is a place in canada okay through the Ottawa Declaration and it aims to improve coordination between various Arctic states and indigenous communities and Arctic inhabitants. Now, okay, moving on. Yemen rebels launch strikes on Saudi Aramco facilities. Okay, uh, please know that. Yemen is in the middle of a civil war since the last seven years uh, where the Houthi rebels are fighting the government which is headed by Mansur Hadi. Okay. Houthi rebels are Shia while Mansur Hadi's government is majorly Sunni government. Yemen's Houthi rebels unleashed a barrage of drone and missile strikes on Saudi Arabia that targeted key facilities including natural gas and desalination plants. Okay, this comes after in 2019, uh, several, you know, refineries of Saudi Aramco were attacked by drones, even though they were deep within Saudi Arabian territory. War in Yemen. One of Arab world's poorest countries, Yemen has been in a civil war since the last seven years. This happened after the Houthis went ahead and captured Yemen's capital, which is Sana'a. Following this, the Saudi-led forces intervened and fought the rebels with the aim of ending Iranian influence in the region. Why? The Houthis are believed to be supported by Iran, which has actually started a proxy war through Houthi uh, rebels. Okay, the UAE also joined the Saudi-led coalition in 2015. However, now the UAE has withdrawn from the Saudi-led coalition. The conflict has its roots in the Arab Spring of 2011 where the country's long-time authoritarian president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, had to hand over the power to Mansoor Hadi. Please remember that, you know, this entire scenario in Yemen is a very complex scenario where there are multiple players. However, over here, you can divide them majorly into government forces and non-government forces. On the government forces side, you have Mansoor Hadi, while on the non-government forces side, you have the Houthis who are fighting and then you also have Ali Abdullah Saleh and you have the ISIS which is fighting both of them okay the political transition was supposed to bring stability to Yemen but President Hadi had struggled to deal with various problems including militant attacks corruption food insecurity etc and because President Hadi was finding it difficult to deal with all of this, the Houthi uh, Shia Muslim uh, rebel movement, it took advantage and seized control of Sana province. And once they took control of uh, Sana, Saudi Arabia had to step in. Why? Because Saudi Arabia knows that if at all the Houthis are in power in Yemen, then it will become a launching ground for attacks against Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia interfered in Yemen after these Shia rebels captured Sana. The rapid rise of the Houthis in Yemen set off alarm bells in Saudi Arabia which saw them as Iranian proxies and hence Saudi Arabia started a military campaign hoping for a small and quick war. But Houthis did not give up and Saudi Arabia had to resort to aerial bombing. With no effective allies on the ground and no way out plan, Saudi-led campaign has continued. Over the past six years, Houthis have launched multiple attacks on Saudi cities for retaliation. How bad is the situation? Since 2015, at least 10,000 people have been killed in Yemen, according to WHO. 
widespread damage caused to infrastructure by air strikes and lack of supplies of food and medicines due to the blockade have pushed Yemen into a humanitarian catastrophe. Okay. Also, the country has seen a massive cholera outbreak. A child dies every 10 minutes uh, from preventable causes, according to UNICEF. Okay. Also, one more thing is that uh, Iran denies the involvement with Houthi rebels. However, it is a known fact that Iran supports these Houthi rebels. Okay, and even Saudi Arabia, it was backed or it is still backed by several of the Western countries such as the US, UK, France, etc. Okay, and uh, this entire coalition it has supported Mr. Hadi's government, uh, you know, it has supported Mr. Hadi's government saying that this is the this is the legal government and the Houthis are illegal. Okay. Now, moving on. Cyclone Asani. Okay. People living in the coastal areas of Andaman and Nicobar were evacuated to safety as the archipelago experienced heavy rain and strong winds due to Cyclone Asani. The depression over Southeast Bay of Bengal intensified first into a deep depression and later into a cyclonic storm. Shipping services between the islands and those connecting Chennai and Vishakhapatnam have been stopped and fishermen have been warned not to venture into the sea as the year's first cyclonic storm neared the archipelago. The system is expected to move towards Bangladesh Myanmar coast. Okay. Now, how are cyclones in India named? Or how are cyclones in the North Indian Ocean region named? Recently, the Indian Meteorological Department has released a list with the names of 169 tropical cyclones which are likely to emerge over the North Indian Ocean and Bay of Bengal and Indian Ocean. Okay, please know that there are 13 countries which are in this North Indian Ocean region. Okay, and these 13 countries have each suggested 13 names and hence there are 169 names with the Indian Meteorological Department in order to give these cyclones. IMD is one of the regional, six regional specialized meteorological centers in the world and it is mandated to issue advisories and name tropical cyclones in the North Indian Ocean region. So IMD has to give advisories not just to India but also these 13 other countries which are a part of the World Meteorological Organization and are on the uh, Ecological, Economic and Social Commission on Asia Pacific. This is United Nations Economic and Social uh, Commission on Okay, sorry ESCAP United Nations Economic and Social Commission on Asia Pacific Panel of a uh, panel on tropical cyclones Okay, uh, so the Indian Meteorological Department has to give advisories to all these countries now these 13 member countries are Bangladesh, Iran, India, Maldives, Myanmar, Oman, Pakistan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, United Arab Emirates and Yemen. While sending their suggestions, countries have to follow some rules. These names should be neutral. Okay, They should not be political or uh, based on political figures. They should not be related to religious beliefs cultures or gender they should be neutral to all these things they shouldn't affect anyone in an adverse manner and the panel the panel on tropical cyclones it can reject any of these names for violating any of the conditions okay so these countries all these 13 countries had sent their names to the WMO or the ESCAP panel on tropical cyclones and in an order one after the other it is the uh, IMD which gives these names which uh, gives these names and which sends out advisories and warnings to these countries which are at risk okay moving on world happiness index 
India may be one of the fastest growing economies in the world, but it is amongst the least happy countries, according to the World Happiness Index. The World Happiness Report ranked India as 160th country, which is nothing but 10th from the bottom. What is the World Happiness Report? It is a report of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. The report uses global survey data to report on how people evaluate their own lives besides economic and social parameters. Okay, it's not just based on economic and social parameters, but how people also think about their own uh, life. The rankings are based on three year average. It's not just based on one year average, rather three year average. World Happiness Report evaluates the levels of happiness by taking into account factors such as GDP, social support, personal freedom, levels of corruption in each nation. Okay. Uh, what are the highlights of the report? It is Finland that has stopped the report for the fifth time in a row. Finland was followed by Denmark, Iceland, Switzerland. India continues to fare poorly in the World Happiness Index with its position marginally improving to 136 as compared to last year's 139. Amongst the South Asian nations, only Taliban ruled Afghanistan was in a worse position. Okay, Afghanistan was named as the most unhappy place to stay in. Also, the happiness report states that India was among, among those countries that witnessed over the last 10 years a fall in life valuations by more than one full point. So it has been a big fall for India in terms of happiness over the last 10 years. Also, the parameters on which you know this happiness is judged is the GDP per capita. One to social support received from others. Three, okay, healthy life expectancy at time of birth, basically. Four, freedom to make life choices. Generosity Corruption I'm sorry Perception of corruption Okay Now Assam Accord Why is it in the news? Recently the Assam government informed the assembly that nearly 1.44 lakh illegal foreigners had been identified in the state based on the Assam Accord and around 30,000 of them had been deported to their country of origin. Now, what is the Assam Accord? The Assam Accord was signed in 1985 by the center under Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. And the Assam government with the All Assam Students Union and the All Assam Gana Sangram Parishad which spearheaded this Assam movement against migration from Bangladesh. The accord set March 24, 1971 as a cut-off date. Anyone who had come to Assam before midnight on that date would be an Indian citizen, while those who had come after would be dealt as foreigners. The same cut was used in updating the NRC. We know that the NRC exercise was carried out in Assam recently on the directions of the Supreme Court. So when this NRC exercise was conducted, foreigners were decided by using this March 24th 1971 date okay now clause 6 of the Assam Accord promises constitutional and legislative and administrative safeguards to protect preserve and promote the cultural social and linguistic identity and heritage of the Assamese people one of the criticisms of this uh, agreement was who are these Assamese people because there is still no clarity as to who these Assamese people are. This uh, has not been defined anywhere. Should it include the tribals? Should it include the natives? Who should it include exactly? Okay. And hence, uh, yeah, that is the problem currently. As per the accord, those Bangladeshis who came in between 1966 and 1971 shall be barred from voting for 10 years. However, recently, if you remember during the CAA, uh, you know, the Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, 
it was it was held that all those people who are coming in from the neighboring countries three neighboring countries of afghanistan pakistan and bangladesh okay they shall be eligible to get the citizenship in india provided they are not people belonging to islam okay now that if you see that goes against this entire assam accord it goes against the assam accord why because the assam accord suggests that march 24th shall be the cut off date now if you are still providing citizenship to people who are coming from these countries even after that particular cut off date okay then that would be a violation of the assam accord what is a foreigners tribunal a foreigners tribunal is a quasi judicial body and it is established according to the foreigners tribunal order of 1964 under the foreigners act of 1946 okay these foreigners tribunals are found only in assam currently they are nowhere else in the country and they are found only in assam its composition includes advocates which are not below the who are not below the age of 35 years with at least 7 years of practice or retired judicial officers from the assam judicial services or retired ias or officers of the retired ias officers or i'm sorry or assam civil services officers not below the rank of secretary or additional secretary and who have experience in quasi judicial works recently the ministry of home affairs has amended this foreigners tribunals order 1964 and it empowered the district magistrates in these states to be to establish foreigners tribunal to set up foreigners tribunal to decide whether a person staying in india is illegal uh, to determine if at all that person is a foreigner or not now the district magistrates can also do that they can also set up the foreigner tribunals Also, the amended order, Foreigners Tribunal Order of 2019, also empowers individuals to approach the tribunals to register complaint against uh, illegal immigrants. Earlier, only the state administration could do it. Only the state administration could register complaints against suspects. While now, even individuals can do the same. They can move the tribunal against a suspect, and that person either can be detained or he can be. send back to the country of origin thank you